This week, three sides of the coin. Still no doormat. <laughs> oh, God. You guys suck. <laughs> we also spend a good amount of time going down memory lane here. First and we're memories. On the verge of, and we're on the verge of uh, three sides after dark. Three sides after dark. Oh, my God. It gets a little racy near the end here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The swingers start sharing food. Oh, oh God. That's enough. <laughs> You gotta stay to watch this one. <laughs> Three sides of the coin this week. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I wanna rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I am one of your three co-hosts. Three? Three? Michael Brandvold, and as always, I'm joined by Tommy Summers and Mark Cicchini. Woo! Mark, you changed uh, your background for us this week. Well, you know, it's not as uh, crazy as it seems. I just turned my little table around. <laughs> this is what I was normally looking at. Now, uh, now I'm looking at my records. Ah, I have this got little corridor thing here in my. This is not the kiss room, believe it or not. This is the. Uh, this is the outer sanctum. This is the outside of the office, which is uh, why, why my wife's like, you know, originally it was just supposed to be in the room, and eh, kind of takes up the whole basement again. So, what are you gonna do? Well, I like this. I like this better because I can see you better. Because sometimes really? when you're sitting in front of your gold records, everything's really kind of dark. You're crystal clear today. Oh, I normally have that halo effect. It's how I roll. <laughs> it's, more, it's usually meatloaf. <laughs> um, so before we get into things, a little bit of housekeeping. I want to remind everybody, all of our T-shirts and hats, not that you guys ever wear our gear on the show. Thanks for your support, you two. Is, everything's on sale. Don't show it, Mark. I'm going to put it on. Fuck it. It's a bootleg. Tell Tommy and I have one. It's a bootleg. There. How's that? <laughs> All of our baseball caps and T-shirts are on sale uh, oh, for 20% oh, oh, off here. through the end of the year. Oh, so head over to shop. Is that Jesus? Shop three sides of the coin dot com. Did we freeze with Tommy again? See, I'm freezing. Get it? That's one. Oh, oh, that kind of freeze. Tommy, you're frozen again. <laughs> Tommy is frozen. Now, Mike, do you like these? There we go. We lost him again. We're going to continue without him, and he can just get added in as needed. Um, so everything's on sale. Shop three sides of the coin dot com. Twenty percent off through the end of the year. I don't know what how long delivery takes so obviously um don't don't count on getting stuff right away but we ship worldwide we take credit cards um tommy just said he's gonna have to restart skype screwing up on him um so we'll continue without him while he gets his computer fixed um the other bit of housekeeping is i just wanted to alert everybody we are one more week without doormats Oh boy. oh boy! Not much you can say to that, is there? Well, there actually is. There actually is. You've got an update for us? I don't know. We have to wait. I know you've got you've got stocking caps that you're supposed to send to us. I just got those. Like, you, well, you were when Liz was down here when we turned on the the computer. You dropped them off. Yeah, I mean. Are these nice or what? They're they're beautiful. Tommy and I are going to enjoy those on July Fourth when they finally arrive. Like I said, you know that's give or take six months. <laughs> you know the funny part? I, I am when I get paid to do something. Like my, my you, you can look at my feedback. My I, I get paid to do something. I'm there. I'm just like so. Tommy and I and need to I pay trip, you. No, no, no. It's just, it's just weird how I am that way. When I trade something, like trade goes out right away. But man, it's like, yeah, 
I already got something for you. A poster. All right, I'll send it. And you have to keep bothering me, and then I'll eventually I'll send it. Now, fair enough. Normally, it doesn't take that long, but stuff normally it I... doesn't take over a year. Those things are so cumbersome. They really are. Sure. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. <sighs> it's 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 been over a year. We're at another week now, so we're now at what. Chris has got our countdown graphics. It was <laughs> last week was 375 and uh, you know, what's what's 375 days amongst friends? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what's what's 800 days? Right? Yeah, what are you going to do? I should be getting my magazines from Tommy any day now. I already got mine. No you didn't. I did too. Not from Tommy. Wow. <laughs> you had to go to another source to get yours, right? No, I'll get it. I'll get it. Tommy's holding yours hostage. Um, all right. Well, you know what? You and I can talk about this next thing because Tommy hasn't gotten it yet. Not a full review on this yet, but Mark and I each got our copies of um, the Illustrated Guide to Kiss in Japan, 1975 to 2015. Um, my first reaction, holy cow. Me too. Superb book. I haven't read it. I've opened it up. I've looked at it. Um, quality work on the book. Binding is great. Glossy cover, full color pages, glossy pages tons tons of photos in here i mean every is. page is filled with photos killer looking design and layout on here um i am i am so looking forward to um diving and in Mike, and reading this one and this is what you got to tell the people it's from japan but it's all in English. Exactly. Yes. The text don't don't worry. All it, it's 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 rare that you can get a book from Japan that's written in English that you can actually read. Now here's something I want to show. This is the kind of stuff. If you guys remember the HBO special, you know they go into detail about the show. You know what I mean? And there's look. I was telling Mike before we started. You know, I'm I'm about the most biggest kiss geek you'll meet. I mean, just like you guys too. But you know, from the beginning, I've been there, read everything, you know, large archive of material. I'm three pages into this fucking book, and I'm reading stuff I never read before because it's all Japanese centric. It's not the same stuff that we got regurgitated to us, even through the band. This is seen through Japanese eyes. And right out of the gate, they're saying when uh, Neil Bogart went over to Japan to, to broker a deal to get distribution over there, they, there was two people from, uh, from Victor. They didn't want Kiss. The, they basically drew straws. And the guy who got Kiss was like, oh, <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted that band Fanny, who were also signed to Casablanca. And it was funny when Alex was on, he was talking about Susie Quattro. One of Susie Quattro's sisters I was in that band. Yes. Well, just for the one record. Right. They're actually a really good band. I, I've uh I went back and, and checked out some of their YouTube stuff. I do that. I'll look at bands that open for Kiss or bands that open for any band that I liked and always want to see, you know, why were they on the bill, you know? That band Fanny was really good. I mean, like really, really good. I was surprised. And they rocked really hard for girls. I know that may sound sexist, but go back to that era. You know what I mean? You didn't have the hearts. And, yeah, I guess you could say, it was, you know, you had Janis Joplin and and um, uh, Gracie Slick and stuff. But these were four girls. And they were basically set up like Deep Purple. They had organ, uh, guitar-based drums. And they, they rocked it, man. So when I was listening to their stuff, I'm like, wow, I can see this on a hard rock sort of tour. Anyways, the that's basically uh, through Casablanca. There was either Fanny or Kiss, and they wanted the because Susie Quattro was really big in Japan at the time. Kiss was nobody, right? So, um, like I said, right out of the gate, 
you get that kind of story. And I'm, I know I won't ruin it for you because th- there's many more things in here I was I was I was learning. I'm about a third of the way in right now, and I'm and trust me, you know, if someone like me who's you know an archivist and geek about this stuff is learning stuff, I, I can say that you are too, you, and you're going to be very. Yeah, happy. I'm I'm just, you know, I've always loved. Um, anything kiss in japan the visuals have always been great the quality of what they do in japan for kiss was always interesting but it was always a challenge because you could never read it and there you knew there was always some interesting back history but you never knew what it was and now that this book is in english man i'm just i'm looking forward to the stories it's going to be like a whole you know first time kiss all over again well if you go back through some of your old music lives they transcribe some of the some of the content and the OBIs, they transcribe those for you so you can read them. And once again, this is all Japanese stuff. They don't, there's not a bunch of them. It's, it's everything. Um, like I said, everything that from they did in Japan uh, right now, I'm uh, probably in the book just about to 1978. Um, and, and that's another thing. Uh, I've mentioned it on the show before. Why is the 1978 tour? There's nothing there's no pro shot video. There's a couple great. I tell you what, if you can, I don't know what date, but there's a great Kiss '78 from Japan bootleg, and it's an audience. But I, 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 I've always said to myself, I wish that one was 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 recorded professionally because arguably it's probably my favorite 1978 bootleg. The way they played, they were just they were on fire right there. I don't know what it was, but that that's a real special bootleg to me. That I'm trying uh, to find the um, website for this book, Illustrated Guide. Oh, it, it, the website doesn't work. At least oh, it didn't. I had to email. Well, no, um, you you do. I do, but I want to be able to um, send people somewhere. So here, um, head over to uh, kissinjapan.com. And that's where you've got the information, and you're going to have to email the author to order the book. You can't actually order it and pay online. You'll have to email the author and, and send him via PayPal. Um, but it's legit, Mike, and I have better books. To- totally legit. Don't worry about it. Um, you'll have to pay in Japanese yen. No big deal. It's 3,000 yen. And I think with shipping from Japan for the book, it was like 40 or 50 bucks U.S., so it was a very fair price. Well worth it. Well worth it. I mean, I can't. It's the book is uh, one hundred and ninety-two pages. Great so. color. Um, one thing I really liked was all the ads. It's funny because everything in here I've seen before. Um, I read a couple, you know, because I belong to a bunch of Kiss sites and stuff. People. Every one of those posters I've bid on. I don't have them all. I have most of them. And it was nice seeing those posters in print because I've talked to people about some of these posters and they'd never heard of them because I'm a big poster collector. One thing I was really happy about, and, and people who have been um, over to the Appreciation Society will see, because I always get commented on, I have this, uh, I have a, I have a, a poster that promotes the a showing of the April 77 show, and they showed it in the theaters there. I've got a promo poster for that, which I didn't see in the book. It's the only, I was kind of surprised because I was hoping to see that one in there too. So, you know, just as a poster collector, it was kind of cool. Um, one of my Holy Grail posters, a couple of them are in there that I've bid on. I, I just haven't been able to, you know, somebody outbid me every time. And um, there's some really dynamite posters uh, in there, pictures of them. So, like so, I said, as so, a collector, so two two thumbs up. I mean, on this book, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I tell you what. So far, uh, uh, it's a ten out of ten. This is the way it should be done. Um, I, I'm assuming you haven't found a turd in a punch bowl. No, no. You know what? It, it, you know, all joking aside, it's it's got everything that I look for in a book. All the pictures are relevant. All the text is relevant. Everything in here is relevant to why I bought it. You know, I bought it about knowing about Kiss, and it's not like I said. These aren't just stories of what I. It's all 
to the point, concise, well, well written. It was. It's, it's just a great, great yep. read so far. Like I said, I'm only and, about and, a third and listen, in. I think there are only limited copies of this available. So head that head, was my head, head head over to kissinjapan.com and email the author if you want a copy of the book. <clears throat> Let him know you heard about it on Three Sides of the Coin, and um, hopefully he's still got some left. And you know, came shipped just fine. Packaging was good. Oh, that packaging was fantastic. It was, it was fan- no, oh. you know the book the book came in great condition. So thumbs up on this book. Great job. Great job. Um, so Tommy's ready. Let me um, add Tommy back in here. Take three sides of the coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. All right, we've got Tommy back for how long? I don't know, but it, it really doesn't matter. We just proved he's not important to the show because... I've been saying that all along. Mark and I did just fine without you. Yeah, right. You also come <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm the one level-headed person in the group of three here. What do we need that for? Because <laughs> I know how both of you are. <laughs> yeah, you've stirred the pot plenty of times. Please. <laughs> According to who? Please. It's your fault. It's all your fault. Exactly. It's all, um, my- all right. So um, I think a little bit of news that's worth maybe um, chatting about is is the new Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees were announced. And um, two bands that we're all very Big excited favorite. to see getting in finally, Cheap Trick and Deep Purple, I finally get in. I Just- got my uh, – yesterday when it was announced, I also got my – Holiday card from Cheap Trick. I was surprised that Bun's on it when I saw it because that's official, right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah but he's still an official member of the band. He just doesn't tour with them or record with them. <laughs> so in other oh, words, I thought he record. I thought he records with them. <laughs> he just doesn't tour. With I don't them. think he even records with them. Oh, really? Now that would be news to me because I had no idea that Dax was the drummer on the new record. Yeah, I think I think it's Dax. I think Bunny. It's just it's sort of one of those Peter Chris type deals. You're still a member in the company, but you have nothing to do with us. Right. Mm. I don't feel bad about it. No, I don't either. We've talked about it before. I mean, I think mm-hmm. Cheap Trick right now is uh, is phenomenal. They've got a new album coming out on April 1st. Please yep. support yes. it. And they've got a yeah. second album already in the can. So wasn't it Tom who was saying something in an interview that they want to like record a, a new album every year now? They want to release yeah. a new album every year. I'm Which all I think for is, that. I'm, no kidding. I'm all for that too. And you know, speaking of that, Mark, I agree. Get out there, people, and support them when they put their record out and support your other artists as well. I went to Best Buy the other day and I picked up two new CDs. And that's the first time I'd bought anything new that way in a while versus iTunes or something like that. And it was really, it, it reminded me again of how much I love discovering new music to take it into the car, pop it right into the CD player. And I've been listening to it for a couple of days. I bought the new Buck Cherry album, Rock and Roll, which overall I think is a really good record, although Tight Pants is kind of a stupid song, but that's neither here nor there. And then the latest one by Blackberry Smoke, which okay. I can't take out of my disc player. God, is it good. So people, get out there, support your artists. Don't just buy the Adele CD. Yeah. Which I, what my daughter did. <laughs> Which is fine. Uh, that, that's a phenomenon that she might be writing the ship for some artists. But I think it's it begs an interesting question as to why is it that she can sell three and a half million copies of her new CD and these other artists who claim to have millions of fans don't get out there and support the artists when they do release a new record. We need to. We need just a little slight diversion because I had a friend of my wife's asked me to get. I could get some Adele tickets for. Have you guys looked at the ticket prices for that show? Oh, I just, I just shared. Well, they're secondary tickets. I've seen secondary tickets five thousand dollars for yeah. secondary market. Yes, I had heard on the news today when I was at the club that apparently they tried, at least here in Minnesota, because she's coming here for two shows. I didn't know this at the time, but the tickets had already gone on sale. And within nine minutes, they were completely shut out 
Um, and the nosebleed tickets at the Target Center, wherever she's going to be playing, are nineteen hundred dollars. That's the cheapest ticket to get through the door. If so they're failing miserably. That, if you if you're buying a regular standard nosebleed ticket, no enough, no premium. Look, it the concert touring business is already bad enough. I mean, I just don't. Again, you can go back to some things are you know only worth is what someone's going to pay for it. I can't see anybody. Like I said, I'm going to use my my wife's friend. You know, <laughs> there you go. You, you're going to go pay two thousand dollars to sit in the upper bowl. Who's, right. Who thinks that? I, it's it's it. I think the way that Adele can solve this problem is to add if, it, if you have a demand for that type of a show like here in Minneapolis, then keep adding shows because sooner or later it's over for the scalpers. And I don't have a problem with people who sell over face value because I buy tickets that way sometimes yeah, as I'm well. A guy at times, but yeah, but $1,900, $20 more, not right. And she's going to, and, and, and I'm sure she's got a great voice. I, I don't deny her talent. It's just, she's going to come out there and just stand there. Not that that justifies or doesn't justify something. She's not going to breathe fire and fly to the rafters. Yeah. And say, I want to come out and see you, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of like, I was trying to explain it to a friend of mine the other day. Cause he, he really wants to go. And I want, I wanted to try and help him get some tickets, but it's like, do you do realize that she's probably just going to come out there and stand, which is going to be like having the CD. So there's not going to be a show, but the $1,900, I was stunned by there, hearing, you know, that. there, there's, there, this is such a bigger discussion that we, we don't have time to get into, but there's, <laughs> because I've been involved in ticketing before, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes here. I mean, especially oh, yeah. when it comes to the secondary market. And a lot of it's been in the press over the years, how <clears throat> how artists have been caught selling their tickets directly to the secondary market. And I know they are. Because like it's Monty. a guaranteed sale to them. They, they, they don't care if the secondary market doesn't sell the ticket because they're, no. they, get, they get the ticket sale when they sell it to the, mar- the secondary market market themselves so in their mind the show is now sold out and somebody else is on the hook for it and in the case of Adele and I, I have no idea what's going on there if, it, if that was the case but now you've got scalpers who are literally just playing the supply and demand game and they're hoping the demand is intense because she's sold Three million copies of her album already, or is it six million already? She's I, last I heard was three and a half. Three and a half million. She's at number one for like six weeks in a row. Um, you know, she's all over the place. So scalpers are literally just going, "Geez, there's a lot of people." Adele, Adele, Adele. People are going to pay this. You, you really know, think your average run-of-the-mill music fans going to pay nineteen? No, no, I, I don't. I think what, I, what I'm what i saying is I think that's what the scalpers are thinking. They're and I thinking. Think, I, I, and, and, and I think they're thinking wrong. I think you're going to see this settle out when all of a sudden nobody is buying um, a $5,000 ticket, a, a $2,000 ticket. You know, then the scalpers have to drop the prices because they're going to be eating those tickets. Right. And I think well, that that's what's going right, to happen. Right, right now, they're just hoping that there are going to be a lot of people that, 6 million people, they're hoping that 600,000 of them want to spend a couple grand to go see Adele. Which, no, they don't. No, and because like even with the Rolling Stones when they were here last summer at TCF Bank Stadium, the you could get a lower level seat from a scalper for 25 to 50 bucks over face value. And so you're looking at a $200 ticket and that's for the Rolling Stones. So I don't understand where they can just go, okay, well, Adele is selling records. Let's just charge 1900 bucks. That just seems insane to me. So I hope everybody stops it. And I was reading an article the other day by a, on a, a guy who wants to go see Bruce Springsteen. And there's a bunch of floor tickets right now available at, in Minneapolis for the show coming up in February or March. And they're only a little bit over the cost of the seats currently, which surprised me for one, but he was saying out on the East coast that the scalpers got a hold of everything and the general admission floor tickets are well over a thousand dollars a piece. And he was, as he was complaining about this, he was, I'm assuming in New Jersey, he walked into a little restaurant and there was two or three motorcycles there. And one of them was Bruce Springsteen. 
And he's like, I went up to him and I started bitching at him about it. <laughs> like, well, how is this happening? You know? And I, I just, I don't understand the $1,900. I just, that blows my mind. That's so just, again, that's just, that's the secondary market. The scalper is thinking there's going to be demand and, and hoping that they find um, a dumb enough consumer that's willing to pay that. I, I think they finally, I think they finally, that, that is a recipe for failure because not only are, I think at that point, people just stop even looking for tickets. Well, yeah. Look, yeah. You, could, you could have, because you guys know my taste, you could have a cheap trick Nugent purple kiss show and I'm not paying fucking two grand. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay five grand to go see the very last kiss concert of the original four guys. No, of course uh, not. For the last, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I can promise you right now, I would not. Okay, well, I'm going to debunk a myth here, just so that we're speaking accurately. I'm pulling up as you guys are chatting here. I'm pulling up the um, Adele show in Minneapolis, and. Um, I'm going to try and find out while you guys are chatting where where the ticket prices are. Because I'm again, curious. keep in mind this is all secondary. This is not what what Adele yes. set her face values no, at. No, of course not. Of course not. This is okay. So but Adele face values were very expensive too. They were well, way more than a higher a normal ticket. Well, was. sure, but they weren't five thousand dollars. And and, no, 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 and, 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 still... and Adele is not getting five thousand dollars when that secondary ticket sells. Well, I want people right. to keep I'm that saying, in mind. But it doesn't I... sound like it's everybody. Here, here's a perfect example. Uh, there's three tickets in – this has got to be – well, maybe it's not a misprint. There are three tickets in the upper upper level section, row one, so nosebleeds, and they want $9,494 per ticket. Then you go over – yeah, then you go over one section, okay, one section to the right to 212, and they have – uh, row two, which would be run row behind it and about 15 feet over, and they want $385 per ticket. So there's probably only one or two guys that are like this that are asking an absorbent amount. Uh, again, they're they're just hoping to get really lucky because all you got to do is sell one of your tickets for $5,000 or $9,000 and you're freaking set. Exactly, and that's what's happening because you can get the the lower level tickets on the floor right by the stage. It looks like for thirteen hundred dollars, which is still outrageous. <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean that that's that's different than the reports I'd heard on the news today that the nosebleeds were nineteen hundred because that's just essentially not true. <laughs> you just said they were nine thousand. That one is. I was shocked by that. So the cheapest ticket I see right now. Uh, in section 201, which is like way up in the corner, you can kind of see half the stage. That looks to be about two hundred and seventy nine dollars a ticket. But still, I'm curious what the what the price was. You know, the face value. Yeah, I I have no idea. I'm guessing that they were. It, she was probably in line with Madonna, so three hundred a ticket would be my guess. But you know, with Madonna, and I'm not, you know. But Madonna put on a big show. I was big. Oh, it was amazing. I saw it. It was incredible. Well, I, I didn't see. I just. Oh, I think it was some of your pictures. Then I saw time, I and mean, they were really oh. good. Yeah, she's phenomenal. I, I mean, I, she's certainly not my favorite, but I'll well, always go and see her. Let 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 let's let's get back to the Sorry. Hall of Fame real quick here. So, um, Deep Purple, Cheap Trick going in. What happens if the Hall of Fame inducts? more than just the original members of those bands. Well, cheap trade, just let me get on my, my little deep purple thing. Obviously the most successful and the one that most casual fans in, the, in this music that is on classic rock radio is not the original band um, with the exception of Hush. I mean, the, that's the second incarnation. So if you want to go original band, you're not putting Ian Gillen and Roger Glover or even David Coverdale or Glenn Hughes in. The, and this is what I thought. Now, I read Ian Pace's interview, and according to Rolling Stone magazine, the original band is in, meaning Mark One. That's what they're called. It's in the mm -hmm. deep purple circles. They call it Mark One. And they only had one hit. I mean, big hit, Hush. They also did a version of Kentucky Woman, but which did have some airplay. But Hush, well, Hush had Rod Evans as their original lead singer. 
and Nicky Simper was the bass player. Well, the next version of Purple, Mark II, is the one that everybody knows with Smoke on the Water and Highway Star and, you know, uh, Woman from Tokyo. That's, you know, but according to Rolling Stone, Rod Evans is being inducted, but Nicky Simper isn't. Well, he played on the same stuff that Rod did. They got canned the same time. And they got hired at the same time, which Mark, I just thought was odd. Here's some here's some tough love for you. The drummers and the bass players of the world are not as important as the singer. Fair enough, but Ian Pace is the only original member from start to finish. No, I understand that. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just saying in, in the screwed up logic of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that's probably how they see well, it. I mean, at, people... at, the, at the end of the day here, are we going to get just more, as you just said, screwed up logic where they insisted it only be the original four members of KISS and nobody else, even though the other versions of KISS have been highly successful. Correct. Millions but, of records. But, but in, as you're explaining here in Deep Purple, now those same rules are not applying to Deep Purple. Exactly, right. which bothers me as a Kiss fan, and I, you know, if anybody's a Facebook friend of mine, you, I made a couple rants. One of which was exactly that. Mm-hmm. How come? Look, I here's my philosophy: if you play on the records, because I get maybe if you're a touring session musician, I get that. But if you're on the record, if you're on the records, you should be in. Yeah, I agree. And what because does that if, hurt? What if does you got a bringing well, if you, putting someone else's putting someone's name in the hall What's i don't hurt? think it's well and, and the way i look at it is take cheap trick for example okay they've been around for 40 years it took more than four guys to help to keep that thing moving forward so john brant should be inducted dax nielsen should be inducted and they should even induct pete Kamita. Because he did write the song Reach Out, he did tour with them, so he was an official member of the band, you know, even if it was for six, eight months, whatever the time was. Tommy, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. If you, especially if you write, look, this this is really a no-brainer, and it's pretty obvious, the prejudice, and that's exactly what it is, the prejudice and the politics of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Because look at Springsteen. Anyone who even looked at him got yeah. in. Well, they, the Grateful yeah. Dead songwriters Grateful. got in, not just musicians. Yeah. Songwriters of the Grateful Dead. Yeah, I think it's because they want they 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 meaning the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame view the Grateful Dead and Bruce Springsteen as a valuable artist, and they will bend over backwards to make sure. Well, Bruce's that, manager is very tight with the Hall of Fame. Well, there you go. And they're going to bend over backwards to accommodate him because they think having him in is important. The only reason, let's be honest, that Kiss got in at all was because they got tired of people bitching about it, number one. Secondly, we finally got some younger people that are in the voting block for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that are that view them as their band or a band of influence. And thirdly, they need their name in there now to help try and you know sell some merchandise. Don't forget them something too. They just replaced sixteen. Matter of fact, Paul Stanley posted it on his Facebook. Yeah, sixteen they just, people. Sixteen people on the original border, gone. Voting committee. Got to remember gone. too. Once you're in, say like when Guns and Roses was you know inducted, those guys get to vote now. And if you look back, same thing with uh, when Metallica got in. There's going to be four votes for Deep Purple. There was four votes for Kiss because Slash and and those guys, all those bands now get to vote, and they were all very vocal about getting. Matter of fact, I think in um, James Hetfield's speech, he's like, "Where the fuck's Deep Purple?" You know what I mean? Where they, where's Kiss? I mean, this is back in the in the day. But I tell you what, you know, just as a music fan, there's there's two bands in particular that I'm a huge fan of that don't even get a sniff. One is Iron Maiden. Now, say what you will, and this is this really, look, the three of us are Americans, but I think one of the downfalls of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is they see everything through American eyes, not mm-hmm. the world. Because Iron Maiden is one of, if not the biggest touring Ooh, hard rock really band. Influential. Mm-hmm. And they haven't gotten a sniff. They've never even been nominated. Their name has never even been discussed. This is the biggest hard rock band in the world, not just not America, think big, in the world. 
is Iron Maiden. They can go to South America. They can go anywhere, and they're going to draw a huge crowd. Their records still sell, and they're still putting out music. Not even a mention? Not even a mention? That's because they... the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame look at themselves in the mirror going, here's a band that's bigger than... 90 percent of the people you've put in because the, the the guys that are they're on the original voting block are no better than the trolls that we deal with they have an opinion they expect you to see it their way and if you don't see it their way you have no value to them so when they look at a band like kiss they view it as a cartoon joke they don't understand how it is to be a fan of a band like that or iron maiden or whoever you choose they only see validity in um bands that they like and bands that perhaps influenced those bands quite honestly i don't know the first thing about muddy waters i don't know if he's good or he's bad but i don't view him as rock and roll so he shouldn't be in there either you know I see, I see. The roots of rock and roll do belong in, and I and I'm a big fan of Muddy Waters and the Blues guys. But now here's here's where things change a bit, because now looking at through it through American eyes, obviously you guys know I'm a big Nugent fan. That guy's had seven multiple platinum albums. He had over eight top 100 singles. He's had top 10 hits. He played stadiums. In the 70s, at one time in the 1970s, he was the biggest solo concert draw in the United States. Now, keep in mind, Kiss in 79 played the Silver Dome, but they cut it down. They called it the Mini Dome. The year previous, Ted played the entire fucking thing and sold it out. Well, unfortunately, you know, with Ted, though, his politics are what's creating a problem for him. To. This is, this, this is where, it, here's where I'm making the comparison. How can Jackson Brown get in and Nugent not being looked at when they were around the same time and through sales numbers, concert figures, it's not even fucking close because Nugent Jackson Brown's a darling of the Nugent had way more input. He was selling Gibson guitars. He was selling Fender amps because they always say that impact and, and, you know, in success, Nugent had that in spades. But like you said, Nugent didn't go to the, wine sniffing parties he wasn't a no nukes guy he didn't do all the stuff that rolling stone was championing but right. here's one thing that that ted did that kiss didn't do in the 70s he did make the cover of rolling stone magazine and if you go back and look through circus and cream and stuff ted was right up there with kiss and led zeppelin for making you know magazine covers he that's right. how successful he was and he really because of their management they shared management with aerosmith those guys played stadiums all over. They were huge. But one doesn't get the respect that the other does. Now, here's my point, too. It's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Put the politics crap aside. We're talking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So people who were successful rock and rollers should be in. The people who helped sell musical instruments, because they talk about impact. It's a big thing. They have to be in. I'm tired of the politics. I'm tired of the narrow view of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And using, if you want to look, like I said, again, through American eyes, why isn't Ted in? Through world eyes, why isn't Iron Maiden in? Both of them have never even been looked at. Yeah, and NWA even, is getting in. Which is, I was going to close up with that, Tommy. Don't get me wrong. NWA, huge impact musically. I, I get it. But they're they, not rock and roll. I agree they shouldn't be in. Um, just because it's a different genre of rock, which is different from the blues guys. The blues, I mean, there's a reason that, uh, you know, Aerosmith covered Milk Cow Blues and that basically all of Led Zeppelin II, they didn't write. And that's, right. all the, that's how come I, I, I think the Howlin' Wolves and the Johnny Lee Hookers, plus I'm a big blues fan, those guys should be in because they're the roots of it. Maybe and so, but you could also me, make the yeah, argument that they, but because they're not rock and roll, roots or otherwise, it could be argued that they shouldn't be in or they shouldn't be in ahead of some of these other musicians. Fine, bring them in, but don't pile them all in to start with and then ignore all these other bands. I, I'm not a fan of Deep Purple. I'm just indifferent one way or another, but I believe they should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, just like Yes should be in and all these other bands. And to let them go for 20 years after their first eligibility to put in all this other stuff is just beyond me because I, I look at it philosophically i look at it outside of my tastes 
I'm passionate about Maiden. I'm passionate about, you know, Purple and Nugent. And obviously, Kiss is my favorite of all time. But see, the same argument that, that I just made about Ted, I made about Kiss for the last 10 years. Who yeah. had bigger impact? While they were putting Madonna in, who had, we're talk, again, it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let me tell you, Kiss sold a ton of Gibson guitars and Pearl drums. <laughs> People paid attention to it. Well, you, I, I guess what gets me just more right now is because we all know, and it's all agreed, it's it's BS, it's politics, it makes no sense. It's <clears throat> it's the rules of what Kiss was allowed to be inducted for, just the original four, and the following year, those exact same rules are not being applied. To the bands that are coming in now that's just you know that's just crazy when you think about it you know what I, you know i also go uh, an, another great band you want to talk about influence is the cars they were really the first band to make kind of combine rock and pop and new wave in a in a nice package that that first cars album is like a great the, the debut album is like a greatest hits album every one of those songs is on the radio every day yeah, they that's another this. band. That's what I mean. Come on, guy. This would be so easy if they put literally put all the musicians who are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now and just went through the list. Really, it, it, the, the bands like the Cars and Jay Giles, they should be in. They've sold tons of records. They're, they toured the freaking world. Why is it that they're not in? It's politics. It's because you didn't go to Yan Winter's parties and you weren't a no nuke guy and you weren't you didn't hang out in California with them and you, it, that's what all this is about. It's gonna it's gonna disappear. Don't get me wrong. I do see a day when Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and well, you know, it's gonna happen only because they're finally running out of all of their own favorites. Yeah, they've inducted almost they've, everybody. They've inducted everybody they want to induct. Now they've just got to start inducting people they don't want to induct. Now, quietly, because I'm again, I love Steve Miller. He should have been in two decades whenever whenever this damn thing started. And he's kind of a Rolling Stone kind of guy, I would think. I'm surprised he. I was shocked when I saw that he wasn't in. Tom, Tommy, he's the, kind of the same thing with 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 like if you want to use Ted or something like that. They didn't go to all their parties. He, he's a quiet. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the first thing about him. I just know all of his songs. What, what's what I mean? Know. Everybody knows his songs. That guy should have went in decades ago. But again, he wasn't part of the Yan Winter clique the way Jack. I was Jackson Brown's my the, my the one I always go to. Don't get me wrong, he had a couple hits, but impact. I mean, all these things that we got lectured as to as about as Kiss fans, he had none of. He had none of. You know, right, we but we that. also, but but us as Kiss fans also view music different than a lot of those people do. So for me, impact means, like you said, selling instruments, getting people turned on to be a drummer, or a guitar player, or a singer, or whatever, or join a band. That's an impact because of all the people who say these people influenced me to do this. Their I, their version or what their belief of impact could be would exactly be the no nukes thing. Maybe their whole idea of impact is different. Plus, like I said, they view a lot of these bands as a joke. I really believe that. I'm not necessarily saying that they do with Deep Purple, but, you know, I mean, for Christ's sakes, Deep Purple's been around since 1968. Everyone knows at least half a dozen of their songs. Everybody they, who's ever picked up a guitar to learn how to play it has played Smoke on the Water. I said that the day that Madonna was inducted, I said to my friend, name one thing name one guitar player who picked up a guitar because of her and i can tell you every day in every music store from the mid 70s on someone played smoke on the water and i mean every mf and day mm -hmm. that happens daily and it's happened for you know three decades on but they don't get a sniff uh, again a uh, deep purple wasn't put it this way too that's once again looking through american eyes you look through english eyes Purple was up here with, with Zeppelin and Sabbath. In the United States, not as much. Not as much. Because the three-pronged head of hard rock is, is Zeppelin, Sabbath, and Purple. I mean, if you really want to boil, I mean, even if you go watch those things on VH1, the Metal Evolution, what is the three-pronged? That is that. That's it. It was Purple, Sabbath, and, and Zeppelin. They Then everything branched out from there, hard rock-wise. Well, and Slade should be in. 
And oh, I don't believe they, they are. Did. I don't believe they are. are Again, they? they're looking. No, they're not. You're looking through Americanized Slade's. Really, it never was never nothing over here. I'm I'm a big Slade fan, but it doesn't mean that they them. don't deserve to go in. They do deserve to go in because yeah. you wouldn't have a kiss cheap trick without them. Right. I mean, same thing with uh, with the sweet. Another. Right. You go look through the again. They're go look wonderful. at. Uh, oh, I love them. And again, and they'll those vocal harmonies that Queen ended up using. Sweet was there first. Sweet was doing that first. Those high operatics. Those those uh, uh, the, the harmonies that they did. Go back and listen to that stuff incredible but anyways uh boy that was uh <laughs> that was mark's rant yeah well, but you know it's I, I agree with it though he's right you know what they'll get inducted when the the doormats arrive <laughs> did you see that today by the way i i sent it i put it on the thing that chris medic did with the count from the from the sesame, oh, street. sesame street that yeah. was brilliant it is it's beautiful i'm just tired of counting yeah. <laughs> for so for those of you that didn't see it, Chris Medic is our is our uh, a guru when it comes to making um, mems and and shirts, and he's just an incredible designer. Anyways, he he put up a picture of the doormat with 375 days, and then a picture of the count from Sesame Street in the front of it, and it says, "I love to count, but I'm tired of counting." <laughs> I was like, "That God, that's brilliant." Our our, our listeners are awesome. That's all I can yeah. say. Yeah. Hey, um, we can switch gears into uh, Kiss going to be playing in uh, in Florida here yeah, shortly. Yeah, so Kiss, Kiss threw out another new show. Yep. Um, Orlando, Florida. And the Florida. Badlands. And the Badlands. Well, but we've, we've already talked about that. Did we talk about that last yeah, week? We did. Yeah, we did. We, we, that, that, that's when we sort of talked about what are they doing in 2016. Sorry. Um, so th- since then, they've added one more new show, um, April 30th. In Orlando, Florida, they're playing the Moonstone Music Festival. Come out and say hi to me. I will 100% be at that show. I think the next day at the festival is Def Leppard. Sebastian Bach is playing. Kansas is playing. Um, I don't know who. So are they playing. in full makeup then for this, or is this? Yeah, no. This is this is yeah. a full, this is a full on. Oh, okay. Kiss headlining music festival type of gig. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that show because it's uh, my my folks have a place in Tampa, so um, I love when Kiss plays down there because I'll it's pretty easy access. Fly down there, got grab my dad's car, go over to Orlando. It's, you know, whatever hour and a half to get there, not even. Yeah. It's, a, it's it's just I tell you what, I've seen Kiss in Florida a bunch of times, and every time I've went down there, it's always been such a, a fun show. Just because a you're in Florida, it's easy to navigate. You know. If anybody here uh, has ever driven through Florida, it's all nice, flat, and straight. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's easy to get there. You don't have to go around any mountains or. Uh, I think you know, I think even the, I think the festival is like kids, like young kids, are free. It's very family really? friendly. Yeah, yeah. I want to say something so like still un- under 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 ten or something like that. Um, so check it out. I mean, if if you want to bring your kid to their first kiss show, this might be the. Yeah way to do it then go to disneyland disneyland disney world the next day that's what i do i i go there i go to islands of adventure ride a bunch of coasters and go see kiss so so there you go that that that's that's it for kiss in 2016 nothing else is new that we've heard of or on the grapevine or anything like that yeah Um, lots of chat but uh happen well and then uh should, we've had a lot of people asking about the uh kurt oh stuff. yeah we'll give an, uh, an update on the the discovered long lost music video for i everybody wants to know what, what happened to it what's that yeah. all about <laughs> what happened to it nothing nothing well it, it is did, up for it, auction it, again <laughs> it and... didn't it didn't sell he put it up again for auction again um, I don't know if it didn't sell a second time or if it hasn't closed yet. No, there's. He started at nine. At what did he start it at? Nine hundred. I think nine hundred dollars or something like that. And it, it there is there are bids on it, and, but it hasn't met its reserve yet, and I have no idea what his reserve is. So 
um, it probably won't sell again. I mean, I don't know. I, I, honestly, we don't know, guys, because we have nothing to do with that video. We just yeah. we, we just had Kurt on to talk about it because it was a cool piece of history that was found and discovered, but we have no stake in selling of this video, nothing. No, so. of course not. So we couldn't say, and um, I just thought it would have been interesting had he burned it. You know, but, you know, he's not going to do that, apparently. Yeah. Um, so we don't know. I mean, it, this is all Kurt's stuff, so you'll have to talk to him directly if you want any more, more information than that, because that's all we know. Which is nothing. Which is, yeah, nothing. Um, all right, so for today's lighthearted KISS discussion, I kind of threw out a, a memory-based topic of let's do a round table we each throw out a kiss song any song whatever you want and the other the other everybody has to throw out what is the first memory that you have associated to that song it doesn't have to be a review it doesn't have to be it's good it sucks um you know, it doesn't even have to be about that song. It could be, I remember I was here when I first heard that song, and that brings back that moment. Whatever, you know, just memories of, of what we've associated to Kiss songs. How's that sound? Works for me. So I'll start, <clears throat> and um, I'll throw out one that uh, I'm sure will we'll make you guys wince a little bit. Don't say it. <laughs> All right. Here you go. First song. First memory that comes to comes to mind. Let's put the X in sex. Bummer. Horrified. And only amplified it when I saw the video. Yeah, but what I, but but what is the memory that you have? I mean, what is it? Horrified. My band I, I, I've been very vocal on here through the 80s. I kept waiting for my band to find themselves. And I, st again, bought it the day it was released, supported it. And I'm like, why did... You guys remember back at the time, everyone called it, you know, posers or whatever, you know what I mean? And, and that's what they were... That's why I was... That's, that's the memory for me is being so let down. They were turning, they were so following trends. This was everything I didn't like about music wrapped up. My favorite band was chasing trends and it bothered me. It bothered me. That's what I mean. I, I was horrified when I heard that. And then even more horrified when I saw the video. Tommy? Um, pretty much the same thing in the respect. I just thought it was just such a shitty song. And I just, I just looked at it and went, fuck, here we go again. You know, I just, there's, there's no upside to me at all. So my memories are just like click. I just. So my, my memory, and this is interesting. So my memory is sort of the same thing. I was just like, oh my God, this song is embarrassing. The lyrics are embarrassing. The video is embarrassing. Everything about this is just cliche, embarrassing. Um, what are they doing? But my, my real memory was when the video came out i remember watching it and going wait a second paul stanley's not playing a guitar in this video he is truly up there as a lead singer he's always had guitars around him whenever he's been in videos whenever he's sung whenever he's done anything he may not necessarily play the guitar a lot it may just hang there but this was something where I just, for whatever reason, I just noticed in that video, it's like he doesn't even have a guitar. And I'm thinking, is he changing his position in the band? Is he going to now, moving forward, not have a guitar? I mean, it was a little thing like that is what I remembered about that song. Interesting. I don't, I don't know, Michael. My brain process wasn't that way. Keep in mind that that was what eighty eight. I'd already been playing in bands for. I knew that that sort of mindset wouldn't even came in. I, I knew they were just prancing around for a video. You know what I mean? That, that the way you interpreted it wouldn't that 
that yeah, but I but but have. you know, and and I see what you're saying, but I've always seen before that whenever he's pranced around, he's always pranced around with the guitar. He might sling it around behind his back. He might just let it loose in front of him, but it's always been there. And this was the first time he never even started with a guitar. He never handed it. He didn't hand it off to somebody. He was there as a lead singer, like David Lee Roth. Fair enough, yeah. The first time I've ever noticed, and it it was just that little detail where I was just like, wow, this is a little different. It was sort of like seeing Eric Singer for the first time, blonde hair, going, whoa. But that's a perfect example. But that's a a perfect example of your level of attention to detail. I'm always. fascinated by your takes on some of that stuff because you really have a tendency to be able to pick that type of stuff out where I, I would I would be missed on that that would be like I wouldn't I would never have noticed that you well, know and, and 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 that and that's what I'm hoping to to pull out in 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 this discussion is just those strange little quirky memories we might all have it might you know we all agree the song sucked but for me it was just like that little thing of Gee, he didn't have a guitar on. That's what I remember most about that. See, and I was just so turned off by the whole thing. I'm just, I didn't even want to deal with it. I also, re- I also seem to remember that Gene had a huge ass in those black pants that he was wearing. <laughs> just huge. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying you're an ass man. <laughs> I don't know. It was just like hanging out there. I was just like, holy cow, Gene. Cut down on some of the cakes. <laughs> well, your mom brought him the, the, co- the, the cookies, cookies, but that was years so. later. That was years later. I don't know. It was just, it that you know, and that, that was part of the, oh, my God, this video just looks terrible. It's like you guys don't even look good up there. Paul, was, right. wasn't he wearing chain mail or something like that? It was like yeah, something was that just... Cher wore on a video Two videos earlier, way. whatever was that was, shares. that was the Murphy's Law. Everything that could go wrong it did go wrong yeah. in that whole era. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, throw a song out. I love it loud. <laughs> you, guys, you guys, no, no, but go back to the first. <laughs> yeah, go back. Not, not, not the fact that you thought. hate the song. Just what first was time- your? Me- what was your memory? Yeah, that was that was my first memory. Is God, I hate this song. It's so cheesy and crappy, and I was embarrassed that they released it. That was my first thought. My second thought was, oh, that's a cool video, but the song is so awful. Why could they have not made that video for Creatures of the Night? Love the record, love everything about it. Hate the song again. I'm just like, ugh. Your first memory is really you. You, you hated the song, but you liked the video. Yes. Okay. Yes, I was really I was because I I just took an inordinate amount of shit at school over it on top of it because apparently all the people that weren't big Kiss fans thought it was horrible too. Well, they always thought it was horrible, so that never influenced me. No, but but it it was bad. It was really bad. I mean, my 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 first memory was I love the song. I thought it it had a great Kiss feel to it. It just had a great hook, great everything about it. It's the A A A A A part that I can't stand. And 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 after that, my real memory is, I was going to um, I was going to college at Normandale Community at the time, and this is when MTV first came out. So they had a big TV room with a giant screen TV that was playing MTV twenty four seven in there. And everybody was trying to get in there to watch MTV, and I just remember every free moment at college, I'd be sitting in there going. Are they going to play I Love It Loud next? Because I knew the video was out. I was just like, I want to see it. I want to see I Love It Loud. I want to see I Love It Loud. And just sitting there, never seeing it. Having to watch Thriller like 20 million times. That's a 20 minute. <laughs> That's their whole break. <laughs> like, shit, I got to get to class. But, but I just remember so obsessed with wanting to see, And I don't think I ever saw MTV ever play it. But I was just like, I want to see MTV play this video. Yeah. I, yeah. My my recollection was three years of prayers were answered. The heavens opened up. Life was perfect again. Heavens were on fire. Yes. 
I was not yet. They, a few years I before was they the started. Happiest kid you could possibly imagine and i remember when jj jackson said that they were going to play it my i was coaching hockey at the time my brother's team and i'm like we were he had i don't know if he had a game at like nine o'clock or something they were playing at like eight and the rink was like an hour away and i'm like i gotta wait i wait and i had to drive my brother to hockey and i'm like Come on, this video just please fucking. And finally, it came on, and we watched it, and boom, right out the fucking door after that. And then I started because um, I talked, you know, cause my music geek friends. They started playing "I Love It Loud," but it was like they played it like one in the morning. And I remember on school nights, much like you, I would stay up just so I could see it. And I, I'm like, it's perfect. This is they're back. This this is the band that. You know, yeah. because I felt I, that way too. It, everything about it was kiss. Yeah, the flames and the I don't know. It was you know I didn't do 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 do. Yeah, yeah. Like it was gone. You could just see they crushed all that, and they were back to being. It, for for me, it erased every every bad memory of Unmasked. Everything that was wrong with Unmasked. Creatures of the night totally it was like blew the flame and just burnt that album to a crisp and it melted away yes it all was right with the world yep. and, I, and again i remember at school i had unmasked on one side of a cassette and i had um women and children first by van halen and obviously i was women playing and the children van first is a awesome album i know but i but Love keep in mind the timeline that they came out right very, and i you know that's when i was recording my albums and you know, i'd bring my jam box and it's like oh what happened to kiss because you could you know that, that that's a great example of timeline being important go yep. go listen to those two records back to back and you tell me what a 15 or 16 year old's going to want to yeah. listen to. yeah tommy <laughs> tommy your song god there's so many to pick from i'm going to pick, i'm going to choose um, God, there I had like five, and I don't know what to, which ones to pick. Um, well, I, I I chose what I chose for you guys because I know how polarizing the song is. Yeah, I, and, I, and but I don't have that so much was, for you, and so I'm thinking of older memories, and so the one that keeps popping into my head is the is "Take Me." Okay, hmm. Michael, go ahead. Take me, boy. What is a memory of that song? Julie likes it. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta say, because nothing, nothing immediately jumps into my head. But I gotta say, it's probably a memory of. And you're gonna correct me if I'm wrong on this, but hearing them play that on the convention tour. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Hearing them play that on the convention tour was just like, oh, that's just so cool. It sounded so great. I mean, I, granted, it was acoustic, and they probably didn't play the entire song like they did for most stuff. But it was just, you know, at that time, it was like, wow, they're really pulling out some cool stuff here. Okay. Mine with Take Me, and it's very vivid. I'm glad. It's odd that you chose that one. From Love Gun on, I bought the records. Every single Kiss record that's ever been released, I bought on the day it was released. I didn't buy Rock and Roll Over the day it was released. And a friend of mine did, and he brought it to school, and we had whatever, art day, and the teacher was really cool. Matter of fact, my teacher in that year had a the 76 poster in our, in our schoolroom. And I remember for art day or whatever, he brought rock and roll over. And I just remember staring at the freaking cover and he played it. And I remember I can still picture what everything in that room. I was so mesmerized by it. You know, we were, you know, it, it, it wasn't art. It, we, we, had, we were doing something to the room. And I remember the teacher let us like turn that record up all the way because the one thing I remember is the, and it wasn't take me, but it was the lift your dress. You want to impress him. And we're looking at my teacher and he kind of looked at my friend. <laughs> like, what are you guys listening to? But <laughs> it was, uh, but I mean, it, like I said, that's a vivid memory. And I, I remember rocking out to take me that, that day. Okay. That's great. Tommy. Um, the reason I chose that one 
is back in the 70s, because we had, you know, the record players and stuff, it was relatively problematic on those nice afternoons and evenings when you wanted to listen to your favorite band because they're not on the radio. And so we had a little portable record player that we would put out on the front steps. And I lived in a neighborhood where there were no fences between uh, any of the houses on the front. So we could put, literally, we had three or four homes together and we had a full football field and we'd always play tag football. And so we'd bring all of our 45s out and play those. And Take Me was the B-side to Calling Dr. Love. And we just listened, Rick Carpenter, who's a childhood friend of mine and Bill Fricky as well, we would listen to those 45s over and over and over again, all different ones. And I just always remember everybody loving that song more than almost any other song that we were playing at the time. So whenever I hear that that song take me, it takes me right back to those great fall afternoon and evenings as a kid playing football in the front yard and listening to Kiss. And that, that's exactly the type of memories I was hoping this discussion would pull out. Well, when, when we're talking about songs that I have good memories about, I'll have plenty for you. You know, that was the problem is the first two you guys threw at me were challenging. Well, and and, and I, that, that that's what makes this fun is because none of us know what the song is going to be. So I'll throw another one out that might be challenging for Tommy. Um, lick it up. Mark? Am I going first? Go first. Lick it up. Uh, again, very, very, very happy. Um, it got a ton, and I mean a ton of airplay here in Detroit. Well, because they can play their music, they can play their instruments now that the makeup's off. Right. It's they were crazy. a real band all of a sudden. But yeah. here, here's what I remember. I bought the record the day it, it came out. went to Macomb Mall and bought it. And I remember, I want to say it was either before it was released or shortly thereafter, uh, the rock stations here were playing it. And they were playing it a lot. And I remember being in the car with my friends going, I'm just jamming kisses on the radio. And it was a big deal. And... Uh, like I said, it, that song it's, to this day still brings a smile to my face because it brings back that. Again, it was the same thing with Creatures. I had just the it's back, and I remember being so apprehensive that they were going to take off the makeup. And the first song I heard was the title track, and I'm like, "Home run again, man! They're back!" You know. So I was very happy. Tommy, um, shocked that they were getting so much airplay. I liked the song, hated the video, and was always bothered that they didn't have a solo in the song. So for me, it was like it was half good, half bad in the respect that at least it wasn't a stupid song. Um, but again, I'm just kind of like... <sighs> Shaking my head. It just wasn't a good period for me. Okay. For me, the, the, the first vivid memory of that that really sticks with me is I was working um, at Southtown Bowl in Bloomington. That's where my, <laughs> that's where my job was. Yep. So I was, uh, I think I was working maybe the front counter or something like that at the bowling alley. And um, at the end of the night when we'd close up, I don't know, midnight or something like that. We'd have to, you know, kind of start cleaning the place up, lock the doors, and I would take the little transistor radio that we had at the front, and I'd turn it to KQ, and and we always had this PA system, and literally it was like a handheld CB mic, but it was a click, talk, and it would go over the PA system to send messages. Well, we'd, we'd take that, push it in, rubber band it and stick that in front of the speaker of the little transistor radio and now we'd have music playing throughout um the the uh the bowling alley and uh i remember lick it up coming on and just running up there and just cranking it as loud as could be at the bowling alley because it was just like it was a rare moment when very rare you didn't have to put kiss on to listen to kiss when it came on the radio, it was like, you know, a proud moment for you. It was like, that's my band. 
that's my band playing on the radio that's right now. Right. It's not it's not Bruce Springsteen, it's not the Doors, it's not the Rolling Stones. And, you know, it's not all these other bands that get millions of plays, it's my band. The the other memory was another night at the bowling alley, the bar was just down front of the the front desk and they had a TV in the bar. And it was probably almost closing time and I remember it wasn't that busy, and I remember hearing what it's like. That sounds like Lick It Up. So I come running out from behind the desk, and I peek my head in the bar, and on the TV, they're playing the video. And it's like, screw the front desk. And I ran down into the bar, and I was just watching the video for the next three minutes. I mean, that. so that was my, my memories was it was so cool to be able to enjoy your band's music and videos when they actually were broadcast for the first time. I mean, that just mm-hmm. never happened before right. Lick It Up. Never happened. Yeah. No, and, and I, I I can't say that I was without that type of feeling to a certain degree. It's just, you know, to a certain point, especially at that period, I had somewhat moved on. Uh, you know, Van Halen was just... To me, they were the gold standard then at that point, and I liked what they were offering uh, much more so than Kiss. And I would say the same thing about Motley Crue. See, you know, As, I, I, you know I I love the music that Kiss was offering. I like like Mark. I was like, this album is just awesome. It's a great follow up to Creatures. Um, I wasn't really turned off by the image, the look. I mean that that was rock and roll. Bands were all doing that that Mad Max ripped look. Everybody was doing that look. So it wasn't it wasn't out of place. It wasn't weird. It, and, and it was just all of that, anything that might have been bad was so overshadowed by the, the being proud, being proud that our band finally is getting its day in the spotlight. Finally. Finally. Yes. Yeah. After yeah. years and years of years, of media ignoring them, of school friends telling you they suck. Guess what? They're on TV right now. Right. They're playing it on KQ right now. And you know what? That was that was sort of the, you know, this is we're 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 proud of these guys now. Yeah, and, and I can certainly see that, and I, I certainly wouldn't argue that point. I just again, for me, period wise, I just was like. Eh. I don't think you were really a big Kiss fan. You're not a real no. fan, Tommy. I'm starting to realize that I'm really not. You're just you not know? in the... <laughs> <laughs> what podcast is this? <laughs> I know. I thought I liked him until I started hanging around with you two. <laughs> now I'm just like, what the fuck? Why am I here? Jesus, it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I am just, i wasting my life talking about this band <laughs> with you two knuckleheads yeah no I, I just i like i said it's so not the direction that i wanted them to go and i so didn't like vinnie vincent and i didn't like what they were offering and i just that's where it started to, the wheels came off for me th- until i heard revenge i would have loved to have seen revenge be the record right after creatures I think that could have changed the course oh, no. of everything. I would have been right after Lick It Up, and I would have been fine. Oh, right, whatever. Mark, that's Mark, good enough. That's still close enough, you know, proximity-wise. But Mark, that's what... Huh? I was going to say, Mark, your song. Oh, oh, all right. My turn to pick one. Yeah, he cut me off. Yeah. <laughs> it's Tommy. He doesn't that's care right, about Tommy Kiss. Tommy doesn't care about Kiss. <laughs> Fuck y'all. God, I love this show. I love this show. <laughs> Um, modern day Delilah. Okay. Tommy, you want to go first? Sure. First memory of modern day Delilah is thank you, God. This is awesome. This is exactly what I was hoping for on the new record. That strong Paul Stanley, you know, beginning track still to this day it's in my regular ipod shuffle i listen to it constantly love 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 that song my reaction is the exact polar opposite of that it's just like 
Oh of course it God, is. This is just such a freaking painful song to listen to. Now, the video was freaking cool. Right? They did a video for that one, right? Isn't that the one right, where yeah, they're walking through Detroit? Filmed they filmed it. Yeah, it was yeah. like throws back. That video was freaking awesome. That's the type of video Kiss should have done for Psycho Circus. I hate the song. The song just feels like it's plodding along, just going nowhere to me, and I just can't deal with the song, but I love the video. Okay. Oh, Tommy, you and I, uh, right online. Yeah, but he's I, wrong. He you guys want to get a crazy you, nights. What does you expect? You guys want to get a room for the next 10 minutes here? I'll. Yeah. Two of us are getting a room with modern day Delilah. We're both yeah. doing it. <laughs> this will be the after dark. Well, We're going to make her air tight, right, Mark? Uh, uh, yes, again. I <laughs> Modern day Delilah, much like I love it loud and lick it up. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. There was it was everything that I wanted, and I, I remember uh, I remember um, having a conversation with a friend, and I said, "You know what's so great about this song is that it's a not a rock and roll all night kind of song. It was a serious rock song. Um, you know, it didn't have the you know, like I said, the party whole thing. It was a great kick ass. I can't say enough that I love that song. Absolutely love that song. Love the too. like everything about it. Yep. I couldn't agree more. It was Kiss sounding like Kiss, like they hadn't sounded in years. Beautiful. And in fact, I'll take I'll take it a step further, which will really bother Michael. Um, if you t- said to me today, "What are your top ten favorite Kiss songs of all time?" Modern Day Delilah, Freak, and Long Way Down. Those three would be in my top ten. That's not how even, much I love. Not even close. Yeah, that's how much I love those three songs and those two records. All right, Tommy, you pick a song. All right, I'll pick a song. I'm going to pick Rock and Roll All Night, the Alive version. What is my memory, first memory of Rock and Roll All Night? That's a tough one because I've only heard that song played 5,000 times. Right. What was the very first memory I can recall of it? I'll admit, I don't have a first vivid memory of rock and roll all night. Well, maybe I went back too far, but there's a there's a reason why I'm, I I posed you the know, question. No, no, I, you know, I mean, I will. Here's a memory. It, it may not be the first one, but um, the memory of of seeing the video they created for that when Kiss Exposed came out. Oh, I thought that was pretty. I thought that was pretty cool because it was it went through and showed a lot of history of kiss in that video and i and i thought i love that i love that because at that time we were craving a lot of authentic look back historical stuff from kiss and that was sort of the first time that it 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 came out and that video was pretty cool and that video still gets played a lot when people play a music video for rock and roll all night a lot of times they'll use that one that was created out of kiss exposed yeah my, That's I have a very vivid memory of that in particular. Keep in mind, I already knew the song. It's already because Dress the Kill was played by my older brother over and over and over. We used to sit in our back porch because we had uh, a pool in the back here, a built-in pool, but we had a, um, a, a enclosed back porch. And we put the stereo out there in the summer, so when we were swimming in the pool, you jam it out the back, back porch. Well... I remember vividly because my brother got Kiss Alive like week that it was released. And I remember we played side four for like the first two months. We didn't even play the rest of the record because <laughs> it, I, but you wanted to have memory. I mean, that, that yeah. was we played side four constantly. And I remember we finally had to take the stereo in as it started getting colder after because the album was released in September. And I remember all the time we'd, I don't know, for some crazy reason, we'd just sit in the back porch and listen to music. And I remember that album vividly, side four, being played over and over. And we kept, like, all our stuff in the back porch, like our toys and shit like that. And, um, you know, we were always 
sitting in the back porch listening to side four of kiss alive when you know when it came out that was a big deal with my brother and his his friends my friends it's cool okay Tommy. the reason i brought that up is because it's probably one of the most popular songs that they've ever recorded and my first vivid memory is i didn't care for it on dress to kill so when Alive came out, I couldn't believe how different of a song it was, uh, for starters. And just the impactfulness of the song makes you want to go out and buy the record. You know, I always felt like that song epitomized what they were trying to present. And if you didn't own it, you were missing something. So to me, it was extremely impactful because of that. Okay. Um, all right. I'll go to um, their most recent album. Right here, right now. Tommy? Um, I like the song, but I like Freak and Long Way Down considerably better and wish that those would have been the first two singles. So for me, it's I, I like the song, but it was somewhat of a non-factor for me. Okay. I was just grateful it wasn't Hell or Hallelujah because that's horrible. Hell that or Hell, Hell or Holly, Holly Berry. Holly Berry, yeah. <laughs> it's it, you know sometimes you don't know when something is going to be a classic. <laughs> this is already a classic until you play it, people. So, <laughs> Mike and I just looked at each other like. <laughs> can you call this a classic it's only been out for two years yeah and no one knows it yeah <laughs> uh, i was one of those guys cheering along when he said that because i love hell around i love the well, song you were, you were cheering along for playing the entire live album so <laughs> what does that say <laughs> oh. okay right, Anyways, here, right here right, right now here, right here right now instantly loved it um and i do did love the song i and that's another one of those songs where i'm like i the producer would have made it. Paul, his voice is struggling a little bit uh, in the choruses, um, but liked it right away. I, I tell you, I'm a lackey for the for the last two records. I like them all the way through, both of them, with you know very very few exceptions. Right here, right now, I thought it was a great chorus. Um, again, I had radio giving it a chance because I, I remember being that much into the record, like you, Tommy, like with Freak and stuff. I'm like, what? Why? They should be a video for this. Is Oh my it's just, god! It's it, it's, it's so especially that song because to me it is so representative of how you felt, or at least how I felt growing up in school, being a Kiss fan or being interested in music and not. I mean, I played hockey, but not playing sports and so many of these other things. And don't get me wrong, I had a great high school experience. I I made a lot of wonderful friends, but you still felt like a bit of an outsider. And so, to me, I could just completely relate to that song. And I just, like, how could you not love this? I agree. But uh, the, the song at hand, yeah, for I, I very good memory. Loved it. Michael? Um, right here, right now, blew my mind when, that, when I came across that song as the bonus track on iTunes. You know, Monster, I thought, was pretty solid album and had some good parts to it but when i heard right here right now i was like this is the most kiss sounding song i've heard kiss do in over a decade i mean it was just like that it clicked with me so instantly i was just like oh my god this is just kiss this right sounds like feels like the chorus everything about that song was so perfectly kiss in my mind that i was just like this is what I want an entire album to sound like. This one song. Oh yeah, and, and don't get me wrong. I think it's a great, a great song. There's just a few that I liked more on the record. I, I you know, I, I always say both both Sonic and Monster are really have way more in common with the first six records than anything else they did. Those the way they were the songs were played and written. Four on the floor, hard rock. Those those records are dynamite, and I think I think history will be kind to those records as people get older and you know look at the catalog as a whole because they weren't chasing trends. They were 
they were doing what they did best. They're playing hard rock music, and and both those records contain nothing but great hard rock music. And I don't think yeah. you can say that through the '80s. I really don't think you can say that. As we talked about earlier with you know X and Sai, truly trying to do something that wasn't genuine. The last two records are genuine represent re, genuine representation of who and what Kiss is. Yeah. So Mark, who's I, Mark, me? Yep. Um, this one, because I think I have a pretty cool story with it, and uh, hopefully you guys too uh, do too. Shock me. Tommy, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Yeah. Um, it is a uh, two-ended story on this one. This was the first Kiss album I purchased with my own money. I spent a week uh, in what, June. Um on the roof of my parents' home, helping my brother-in-law re-shingle the whole thing, rip the shingles off and all that, so I could save up enough money from my dad to buy this record. And the anticipation that I felt about this record went beyond the fact that it was a new Kiss record, that it, it, had, it contains a, an Ace Frehley song where he's actually singing. And that was so exciting to me because he was kind of my favorite member you know and so when i got the record i actually put that song on first before i listened to the rest of it and absolutely loved it and still to this day love it it's takes me again back to melrose avenue in the sixth or seventh grade those nice summer nights listening to the kiss albums and hanging out with your friends you know my memory of shock me is is off of Kiss Alive too. Hmm. I think that just I love that version of Shock Me. Solo, I love <clears throat> Ace. We're turning. We're going to turn the microphone over to Ace Fraley. You know the the whole thing. Uh huh. Um. Just awesome. It just it that song sounds so perfect right there to me. Yeah. Plus the solo, too, the whole thing. Yep. Mark? My memory, because, again, um, this is kind of special to me, it was, again, like you, Tommy, it was, that was the first record I bought. We went to Montgomery Wards, and I remember, Mom, it, this comes out tomorrow. We got to go. And, you know, it was summertime, and we went, and I got the record, and I remember op- I opened it in the, in the in the car on the way home, and I saw you know the gun and the and the, of course having a cheat with the stuff you could buy, and I remember um, getting home, and the kid who delivered our paper was a friend of mine, and I remember we got out of the car, and it was like it was like you know you had the the holy grail with you. it was the brand new Kiss record. And I remember just how shiny the cover was. So, anyways. I knew that Ace was singing Shock Me because they talked about it in a lot of the interviews up until then. Yep. Now, keep in mind, I have to go back a few years because when I – first time I heard Dress to Kill in the spring of 75, I didn't know how to differentiate vocalists. I, I thought that Getaway Ace sang because he wrote it. And right. you know, I didn't realize until a little bit later that you know Peter sang that. So, so in the whole time, I'm like, well, God, what's it going to sound like? And that was the song I pinpointed. You know, I played it from the start, though. I didn't fast forward, you know. I played it from the start, and I, that was the song I had all the anticipation for. And when I heard his voice, it was like, fuck, is this cool? You know what I mean? With such a new element to the band, and I, and just, I still love that song to this day. And that first day getting that record, I remember it was a nice day out. I remember talking to my friend out front. He rode his bike up. I remember running into the house. I remember playing it. And, and that song was really like the song for me. That one in Almost Human hit me the hardest because, you know, Almost Human in a way you could, that was really, I don't know how that did not become the, the blood spitting song. I mean, that song to me like summed up the demon. And um, I, I would have totally agree with that. And that was kind of surprising to me that they kept it, they kept God of Thunder for so long. And they they didn't end up yeah that that always kind of but those two songs but the, like I said I, that's those two songs remind me of that day but that that first time hearing Ace sing was really special. You want to do like one more of these for everybody or sure yeah sure. Well, are you getting yeah. bored? 
Or is Meatloaf uh, calling? You guys got to remember, I'm a, you know, I ate lunch, uh, what, six and almost seven hours ago? Take, <laughs> it, 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 Same with us. Because it, it's so intense and exhausting and to sit here and talk about Kiss. It, I can You're s- a Pavlovian dog. <laughs> You know, a long day today. <laughs> All right, one one more round for each of us, Tommy. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to pick. Uh, I was made for loving you, Mark. You want to okay. go first or Michael? I'll, I'll, it doesn't matter. Um, I, oddly enough, I liked it. You know, I I I I was apprehensive, but I got to admit, it was a catchy pop tune. You know, I. You know, because I, I thought that was going to be an anomaly, and it didn't end up being one. You know what I mean? Kind of like Bath. I like Bath. You know, back back in the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I liked it. It was, you know, it was a good song. We could hum to it. And uh, I remember when I saw him at the Silverdome, how much I I really enjoyed it more because it was heavier. And I do remember that, you know, really making a difference. So those would be my two memories. I I, I remember liking it straight out, and when I saw him at the Dome. You know, a month or two after I had the record, I remember that that that, that the grinding. I, I just liked that. I thought it was cool because it really shook the place. My oh, okay. my memory, and it's related to the album, and I can't remember if this was the song, but I think it is because it. I was made for loving you is the first track, isn't it? It is. He's yeah, and this song. one I'm assuming you didn't think was defective when no, you played no. it the first time. Well, but this interestingly enough, this time it was. So I got my copy. <laughs> I got my. You cop- kept the poster. I you? got my copy of Dynasty when they did their in store in September at at Great American Music. That's when I got yeah. my first copy of it. Wow. Not, not when it first came out. Um. So you know, you you get your copy, you go through, they autograph it, blah blah blah. And I go back, so it's got it's got um, Ace and Paul's autograph on it, and I drop the needle on it. And the first track, first, there's a little bit of a warp in the record. So it would, you know, you'd get that, and it's it's hard to explain it. If you have vinyl with a little warp, you know exactly that sound when, whoop, mm-hmm. whoop, 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 yep, whoop, you know, it just kept, and I'm just like, fuck. Normally I'd go return it, but I'm like, they fucking autographed my record. God damn it! You know what? I don't want. I don't want to deal with that. So it's like, all right, I kept it, and just I eventually bought another copy of it. But my memory is of that. Love it. It's so funny. Let me see. Thing. So let's look at this. Okay, so you buy Destroyer, you think it's defective, and you bring it back, and it's not. Then you get Dynasty. It is defective, but you don't return it because you're worried you're going to lose the autographs. Oh, I'm going to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that stuff stays with you. I had a, I remember I had a skip on my Alice Cooper goes to hell or no, uh, welcome to my nightmare. Cause it was during Vincent Price's spot when he's talking about the spiders and, and there's a, and my record for some reason, it was, a, it was a actual defect. It skipped during his little speech. And and it was when he was talking about that Reptomictor or whatever the, the spider's name is. It, the, I remember hearing my friends. I'm like, that's what happened, because it you heard the click, but that long spider name was like Toria. It it wasn't, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I didn't know that it was it was bad until I heard it. I'm like, mine doesn't sound like things like. And I played it for him. I think I went home, brought my record over to his house. He's like, oh, yours got a deep, and it did. And, and, and it, it, it's it's funny, you know, because I remember you you'd get records that might have a little scratch in it, not warped, and you could put like a a nickel on the needle. Yeah, I, and I then it, then it would play through the scratch just fine, and yep. it, and it might actually take the scratch out. Out, it might lots groove, of times. It, groove it out. And it's but, enough weight. But but the warp was an actual bend in the vinyl, and I remember, I think one time I I was like, okay, I'm going to set the vinyl on my desk in front of my window when I go to school, when the sun comes through and I'm going to put like a telephone book on that corner and I'm going to hope that it gets warm and it freaking warps it back straight. You know, as a, as a kid, you're just like anything going through your mind. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just going to try and 
reshape my vinyl record. Of course, it doesn't work, but it's 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 amazing the stuff That's we what would you do. What we would go through back then. It's like whoop whoop. whoop. Well, and that's why I love when people put like those pictures of the 45 cassettes and a pencil. It's like, the, you know, share tape, if you know yeah. what this means. Why yeah, exactly. these two go together? Exactly. Oh, yeah. All right. Did we well, get that, everybody's memory on that song? Yeah. Did we get yours, Tommy? Oh, maybe we didn't. No. We, um, yeah. The reason I picked that was because. At that point, I was so deep into my fandom. I was so excited when that song came out that there's new Kiss music. Plus, I liked it, and it was it. I didn't mind that it was disco because now at least there's a disco song I could like because everyone else seemed to like disco. I'm like, <laughs> so that was part of it. And then also too, it takes me right back again to wonderful childhood memories and going to that in store and meeting them all of them for the first time and getting that record autographed and you know i mean it just it, that song brings back so many wonderful childhood memories that it's almost preceded the song to the point where i like it even more because it's attached yeah, to what it's attached yeah because of what it's attached to it doesn't matter whether it's a good or a bad song it's it's what it's attached to is a good memory yeah and i'm forever grateful to heidi um you know, for taking us, my friend Ward, her his older sister Heidi Harper, which is the coolest chick, and she's like, "You guys want to go meet Kiss?" And we're like, oh, "Yeah," you know. And she had the wherewithal and the smarts at the time to say, "You know what? They're supposed to be there at whatever time. We're going to get there at least three hours early." And thank God that we did, because I'm telling you, that place filled up like you wouldn't freaking believe. Yeah. And before you know it, they locked the doors. So there was probably. I'm guessing 1,500 to 2,000 people inside the building, and maybe not that many, but an additional 3,000 outside that couldn't get in. It was a zoo. It was a yeah. zoo, and they were late. Yeah, they hours, were late by like hours, hours late, late. getting there. Uh, the thing I remember also, too, that I thought was really disgusting is people were, were getting tired of waiting, but it's just like... Whoop de doo! They're playing Kiss songs in the store, and you're. In, and what they did is they put you in rows through the aisles of records. Yeah, I remember there's people in front of me and back of me breaking the records, <laughs> and like whoever they were standing by, like Olivia Newton John. Oh, she sucks! <laughs> and they bust all these records. And I'm just like, you know, if you do that shit, they're never going to have anyone come here again. And so apparently, um, I want to say less than a year later, Ted Nugent did an in store there. And the same thing happened, and then that was the last of the in stores because they lost too much profit, pro, too much product to vandalism. Wow, I didn't know yeah. that. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I literally witnessed it. I'm just thinking. I was just what the fuck is wrong with you people. You know, time for me, time didn't matter then because I was gonna meet Kiss. I, you know, right? They well, were that's gonna, they were, the they were gonna be in the same freaking building as me. And I was going to be able to walk up and shake hands and talk to them. You know, as a kid, your mind is literally just exploding at that possibility. What do I say? Nothing else mattered. I don't care you were standing in line four hours. It doesn't matter. See that table up there that you've been staring at? They're going to be behind that at some point. They're going to walk. When they walked out from behind, from the back door, to, it was like, that's them walking in the presence of me i mean you know as a kid that that's back in the 70s that was what it was like it was right. just it was just awe inspiring to be in the same air as they were and i can't tell you how many times hundreds of times i checked my camera that i had it loaded with film that i had extra batteries and extra rolls of film and where they were so that the minute that i ran out of that roll i could pop another roll in and keep shooting photos. So that's a you know another thing I remember just sitting there going over that over and over and over. Yeah, it, who care I wouldn't wait I would have waited till two in the morning. Who gives yeah, a shit? Wouldn't, wouldn't have mattered. Kiss is coming. It Fine. Go mattered. home people. Yeah. yeah. I just I just remember all the destruction and, and and just being really kind of sickened by it. You know? Cause it's like it was free to go to you didn't even have to buy anything if you didn't want to. And Great American Music is hosting this, and you're going to come in and wreck all their shit. It's, I don't know. 
I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> well, you know, that shit pisses well, me while, off. While you're pissed, why don't you say something about our doormats? <sighs> what more is there to say? I'm tired of counting. <laughs> Your magazine should be there any day. And you know, by the way, Mark, look, your pile, my friend, is dwindling. <laughs> okay? Because I'm getting requests every day. One guy is actually driving here from South St. Paul this week to pick it up at my office because I have one set aside for him. So get your act together, my friend. Mark's just going to get it from another source. No, he won't. Yes, he will. You know him damn well. All right, so um, you actually brought up the song I was going to bring up for my last one here, so I'll, oh, I'll, I'll bring it up. Right. Detroit Rock City. We brought that up? Tommy did. Did he? Yeah. No, no. Right. that was I Was Made For Loving You. And no, take but, me. Yeah, but in the discussion of I Was Made For Loving You, brought up the, the song that I thought was defective. Oh, yeah, oh, that's okay. true. All right, All right so, so Detroit yeah. Rock City, Mark, you go. Are you kidding me? I, a, a, it was about my hometown. Um, yeah, what was that? What was that like to all of a sudden hear a song that Kiss wrote about the city you live in? I can't even describe how. Also, during Kiss's lean times, I, I used to get friends who now didn't like Kiss. Well, that song's all right. You know what I mean? Um, but my first memory is just being blown away. I. I because Destroyer really sealed the deal. You know what I mean? It was just like, now I'm... Because now you can... Because when I... Like I said, when my older brother and older sister, I liked Kiss's music, and I thought they looked cool. And all, but now, you know, in 76, the Destroyer, you, everything just it was melded. They were in all the magazines. It was... What you got there, babe? Hold on here. Nice. Oh, it's gonna... not packing material for the bats. Hold on a second. Oh, look at that. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> That's nice. What do you got? Mm. <laughs> oh, my God. That's going to turn into something. Oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> oh, Lord. Never a dull moment on this show. <laughs> God. Oh my god. This is turning into uh, after dark. Oh my god. I lo I love this show. I love this show. That's all I can say. <laughs> oh lord. Oh, Hi Liz. Oh, How are you? Uh, loved it. Blown away by it. Love you baby. Be up in a few. Um But you know the, that song now I can't think of it any other way cuz they play it before every Red Wings home game. They play it at the at the Lions games. That's when you talk about a memory. My earliest memory is just awesome. As I was growing up, when people who didn't like Kiss, they they always that was a song like, well, that one's all right. Meaning they didn't think for themselves. They were too chicken shit to go. That's a great song. Moving forward, um, like I said, it's played before, and it has been for a, at least a dozen, eh, probably about 10 years now. They play it before the puck drops at Joe Louis Arena for every home game. Very often, it gets played at the beginning of Lions kickoff games, but normally sometimes during the kickoff, that's the that's the song. So it's a big song here. I have nothing but incredible memories, and probably my, my most vivid memory. Michael, were you, you were here for the Tiger Stadium show, right? No, I didn't go to the Tiger Stadium show. Oh, you show. didn't? Let me tell you, because they saved that for the end. I thought the fucking place was going to cave in. I mean, the anticipation for that song. And I remember physically the roar when Paul came out and said, you know, we only wrote a song about once. I mean, you could feel the energy at Tiger Stadium just ramp up. It was, it was literally, I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. it really, it was that impactful. That was really, really cool. You didn't get goosebumps being fed by your wife, but you get goosebumps thinking about Detroit Rock City. <laughs> oh, no, I get, I get different kind of bumps when I get fed. <laughs> they're, only unfortunate thing is they're probably about the same size. Oh! Oh! <laughs> hey, it's not the size of your pencil. It's how big you write your name. <laughs> 
That's everybody that says that's everyone with a small dick says that. <laughs> All right, Tommy, Detroit Rock City. Um, my first memory was dropping the needle on it, brand new, um, out of the sleeve, and hearing the talking piece, and then them go into playing rock and roll all night and thinking, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to love this. And I would say that, again, takes me back to sitting in my bedroom, listening to this song on my brother's quadraphonic stereo sound stereo. (laughs) Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, but I've always felt that Detroit Rock City and um, King of the Nighttime World really go hand in hand together. I don't think of one without the other. You know? And one side note, when I was living uh, in Minneapolis with a buddy of mine, we used to come home from the bar two, three in the morning, hammered and stuff, and we would put a couple of the infinity, big infinity speakers in the window. And we lived on 47th and Nicollet, which is, you know, in Minneapolis. And we would just, we isolated the car crash and we would put that on and pump it out the front window of our apartment building and watch to see how many lights would come on (laughs) in all of the apartment buildings across the street to see who it woke up. And they were all like looking out the window because they thought there was just this massive accident <laughs> <laughs> right in front of our apartment. But I can't tell you how many times we did it till they finally figured out that someone was, you know, just Goddamn giving them kiss fans across the street. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, one, old, one older woman was walking by one day and she caught my, my um, roommate, Michael, and she's like, are you the boys that keep playing that God awful car crash at two in the morning? So that's what I think of. Well, I've told my story, and Tommy hinted to it, but it's it's always worth telling again. Oh, it's a classic. <laughs> so my, my, my Detroit Rock City first memory is, you know, this was... I had seen them on, on Paul Lind. I'd gotten Rock and Roll Over as my first album, and I think I'd, I was starting to fill in my Kiss collection. and And there was a record store down at Valley West in Bloomington. Valley West is a mall, and I think the store was called Where Third... Where was that? Um, Old Shakopee and France. Okay, so yeah, all right. It's still Third. there. It's still Sun. there. Um, and there was, a, there was a small mom and pop record store in this mall called Third Stone Music. Yep. And um, I just remember, you know, and this is when I was just starting to buy music for myself. So you're, 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 you're kind of not sure what you're buying, but you're just buying music. And I'm in Third Stone, and I'm looking through, and I see Kiss, Destroyer. And I'm like, all right, I got, I got some pretty good connections to Kiss now. After seeing them on Paul Lind, I lo- that blew me away. Rock and Roll Overpulse blew me away. This cover looks freaking cool. Destroyer, that looks cool. I'm buying this album. I can't remember if it was new or used at the time or what, but I bought it, went home, dropped my needle on this record. And for everybody out there, you know how Detroit Rock City starts on the album. It's not music. It's the dialogue. It's the radio. It's the discussion. It's the car crash. (laughs) And, And remember, this is like a, 12, 13-year-old kid back then. I'm listening. I'm going, what the hell is this coming out of my freaking record? This is a radio station. What am I listening to? How did this get on my record? It's supposed to be music. It's supposed to be a band singing, not a car crash and a radio report. Somebody screwed up my record. (laughs) Somebody recorded over my record that I bought. I mean, that's what I was thinking at the time. I'm like, somebody recorded over the intro of my record. It's so funny. <laughs> I have, again, 12-year-old, I have no idea how records are made. I have no idea any of that process. All I know is it's supposed to be music on a record. That's it. I'm just, it's supposed to be a song. I'm listening to a radio report of some, I'm like, a radio report? He got into a what the hell? How does this? How is this going on through a record on my? <laughs> I literally, I I'm like, I'm confused, like to no end. <laughs> and I pick it up and I play it again, and it's like it's it's still there. What the hell is this? 
and you have like no one to turn to. I have nobody say. to. Yeah, I have nobody to add. What? What? Yeah, I'm just like, it's got to be a defective record. It's got to be a broken record. I mean, why would it come out like this? And I was this close to. To, to taking it and going back. I didn't. Thank God I didn't go back because, man, that would have been a, a record store geek embarrassing moment of your record's broke. No, it's not, you freaking nerd. Get out of here. You know? God, can you imagine the, the guy behind the counter <gasps> oh, just going? Fucking kid came in and told me his record was broken because somebody recorded, recorded on it. He must be from Bloomington. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I don't know why or how I became to accept that that was a song. Maybe I heard it somewhere else or something like that, and finally it's like, oh, well, somebody else has got it too. And it, it was just, that was my memory of Detroit Rock. He was like, this is a broken record. Somebody recorded over the vinyl on my Detroit Rock City. God damn it. <laughs> I was probably sitting around with my friends going, do you believe that some asshole probably thinks this, this doesn't work right? <laughs> you, you were going, this is such a cool introduction to the song. This yeah. is amazing. And I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is this? Get it out of here. <laughs> oh, God, that's classic. <laughs> oh, it is. I look back, I'm just like, and I still got that Destroyer album here. I should play it and see if it's still broken. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Make sure. Maybe it's not too late to return it. Of course, Third Stone's gone now, so... It might be out of luck, but oh, that was just you know, just a naive twelve-year-old kid. You're just like you don't know any better when you literally are just buying records for your first time. I mean, probably before Destroyer and Rock and Roll Over, the only other records I probably had bought before then were um, the Love and Spoonful, love them, and Brewer and Shipley. One torque over the line? I don't freaking remember. I have no idea why. I think I bought Love and Spoonful because it was their album cover that had a very cartoonish drawing on the cover, and I don't remember which one it was. And I just bought it because it's that looks freaking cool. I'm gonna buy that. Yeah. I had no idea what the music was, and I, you know, and I never listened to them ever again. I'm like, what the hell is this music? But you know, well, that, that's that, why that, the artwork was so important. That's artwork bought is why I bought that. Sold records. It sold the records. But you know, that at that young, young age, and I mean we all probably went through that when you first were discovering music, you had no idea where you were going. It was sort of like very uncharted waters. It's like I'm just gonna buy something and you bought something and you listen and you're like, No, I don't like that. I'm never buying that again. Oh, I'm buying that. Oh, that's very cool. Or you know, your friend across the streets talking about a band. I mean, that's how it all starts coming together. You know, without well, anybody then, giving you direction, you don't know what the hell to buy. And on top of that, think about how many different bands were influenced by what Kiss was doing with the respect of putting together album covers to try to take a piece of that. Like, there was a Kinks release right around 77, then 78. Steve, Steve Miller, the Joker. Yeah. He well, wore, no, that he, was before Kiss, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, because I think that was 73. He wore 72. makeup. Right. But the ones that stick out in my mind are the Kinks record from 77, 78. They spelled their, the band name with the S's. Okay. It was a yellow cover with black writing i don't remember what it was and then randy newman came out with the uh, short people and on that record he's got white face with oh the no that's what i was thinking that's what i was thinking is randy newman not, yeah. not steve yeah randy newman yeah yeah so and that was just two and i'm sure there were more than that wearing a mask yeah well i i, I tell you what, this whole discussion and we'll keep it short but that's why destroyer and in, in detroit rocks that that really solidified everything because and I, I you know I brought up my you know I having older brothers and sisters this Detroit area that I mean, hard and heavy music was what was played on the radio you know really that Stooges and if and if you know anything about Bob Seger you know you may know some of the ballads and stuff later on but early on he was a hard rocker and oh, that was yeah. the kind of music that was played all the time here so Rambling. you couldn't help it was in the water man so, like I said, when when I was a kid going to roller skating all the time, you know, they 
played the Swede in Alice Cooper. And, and you know, in 74, I got my, really my first hard rock record was BTO. And it was, it was that genre that I, you know, so I really didn't have any missteps per se. You know what I mean? Like, and that's right around seven, like I said, 76, I started reading music magazines, circus. I shortly thereafter, I had a, a subscription to circus and cream and, you know, it was it. it. I mean, really, Kiss meant, like I said, just changed everything in my life. And I was so lucky to be there from the start. And I, I remember buying that, um, the red, co- or the orange cover, um, when they talk about, I think it was uh, Love Gun from, uh, Paul's got the yellow streak in his hair. I remember walking into the drugstore to buy that issue of Circus, and that that I think that issue had a, a uh, advertisement for the for the um, for the comic too. And it, it just it man, Kiss was boom. You know, those memories, I'm like that's what I remember. If I go back to the '70s, I remember listening to Destroyer. I remember being in the backyard, you know, in the in my back porch listening to Kiss. It was Kiss, Kiss, Kiss. You know what I mean? And then everything right. branched off. So, you know, it was a cool little walk down memory lane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. This was fun. This was fun. So, homework. Should we just say pick one of the songs we talked about and give us your um, yeah your first memory, the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah. Don't re- it's got to be don't, one that we picked. Yeah, one of the songs we picked. Don't review the song. I mean, we tried to mm-hmm. avoid reviewing the song. A memory. Just what is associated to that song? And who's got the story that's more outrageous than me thinking Detroit Rock City was a defective record? Yeah, is there anyone that done no did one. anything dumber? <laughs> Anybody who did anything more stupid than I did? Yeah, I doubt there'll be anyone mm-hmm. taking awesome. that. Because <laughs> you can't beat that. That is that is, is as classic as it gets. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I'm not afraid hey, to admit uh, my stupidity. Uh, Hey, a couple of things before we go. I want to say thank you to Esteban, guy that I've met on the uh, the Kiss Cruises. He sent me a really cool package of uh, some What's video his last from name? The, the, the. No, what the hell did it, da, da, da. Esteban, look, you know, I I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but a really good guy. Okay. He, uh, I met him on the cruise. Really, really super guy. Um, sent me some some cool music, and uh, I just you know I tell you what just. Again, and by the way, the Kiss Cruise is probably going to be going on sale here in the next few, uh, at least another month. It usually goes on sale the first week of January. Guys, you're going to meet, if go. If you get a chance, you're going to meet the best people. I Like I said, I, I try and sell it all the time just because it really is that amazing. But I, he did send me something, and I wanted to say thank you to him publicly. I just um, thought it Mark, was cool. Mark, is it po- and is, is, also, is, real, real quick, is it possible for you to mail the doormats to Esteban so he could send them to us? Well, all I'm saying is the spot where they used to sit is now empty. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. The spot that they used to sit is now empty. Smart I love asses. how these little bits we have just come out of nowhere and they live with us. Well, and the best part about it is everybody gets involved. They love it. It's like all over the internet. And people are making memes. It's like... This is awesome. You just can't get away from it. I love it. I can't. I, I tell you what, I, next year on the cruise, I'll be hearing about it. Trust me. Exactly. <laughs> Somebody will put oh, a doormat. You know Somebody's going to put a doormat in front of your room on the cruise. There you go. Hey, I also, because this is going to air right before Christmas, I want to say Merry Christmas to everybody because uh, this is going to air next Tuesday. Yep. And, yes. Uh, Merry that Christmas, happy, happy holidays, happy holidays happy Merry Christmas, happy, happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa or, whatever, whatever you celebrate. One, no one loves Christmas more than me. Let me happy, tell you. Happy, happy Kish, Kish, Kistianity if you celebrate Christianity, whatever Jeez. it is. Jesus. Hey, it's Gene's religion. Yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it. Till next week, we're out of here. Three sides of the coin. Bye. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com.
For interviews and media inquiries, contact Izzy at IzzyPresleyProductions.com. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.